Right. Um, I think that's it. I may be live. Right. Just turn off that. Got some music on upstairs today, which should be fun to do this with. So firstly, welcome to those of you who have joined me live. And if you're not watching me live and you're watching this on a repeat of the broadcast later, thank you for dropping in and uh, showing interest in this particular aspect of Tai Chi, something that has been on my mind for some time to do. First up, up. Uh, Apologies for the backdrop because it's just a white sheet and it should have been today a broadcasting studio piece of software that I've got that will enable me to bring in video examples of what I'm going to talk about and static photos and lots of special effects. But as is normally the case with these sorts of things, teething problems have resulted in the blanket. So um, today, just the blanket. Sorry about that. And I'm going to have to try and describe as best I can the examples I'm going to give. But it's going to be a short broadcast, about 15, 20 minutes. And I'm going to be looking at two basically uh, important things. I'm also consulting some notes because <laughs> the software broke down. So two things really balance and peripheral vision on why these are important in Tai Chi and why they need updating in terms of what we know about it and how relevant it is to our practice. So bear with me as I run through a couple of little stories to try and highlight what has been going on these last few weeks. So it already came about because as some of you know that I'm, I'm teaching the Chen Man Ching 37 step form at the moment. Uh, Please come and join us anytime you want to on the Podia 21st Century platform. And what's interesting about doing this course with those of you who are already enrolled with me is that we're looking at trying to update it for the 21st century in the very same manner in which Chen Manching did the same in the 30s, 40s, 50s and 60s. And students of his have continued to do since his death in the 70s. In a sense, all we're doing is really trying to apply what we now know and the research that's been done on health to the study of Tai Chi. So that's all we're really doing. We're not doing anything radically different. I'm not saying I'm better instructor or practitioner than Chen Manching or anyone else. In fact, my Tai Chi is not really that great, but I do hope that I find uh, people taking interest in the way that I teach what I know. So as I've been looking at the Chen Manjing form, there's been a couple of things that have come up, particularly looking at certain postures and the importance of balance. Now, anyone who's looked at my website in the last sort of 10 years will know that always on the first page, in fact, if you go to teapotmonk.com today, you'll see on the first page, there's always an article that I try and get everyone to read about balance and walking, catwalking, and these sorts of things. It's always been one of my most highlighted benefits of practice. But why? Well, uh, a lot of people have been quoting the age-old bit of uh, research when it comes to Tai Chi. When they say, when anyone says to you something like, well, yeah, but is Tai Chi any good for you? They always drag out the same bit of research that's now about 20 years old, and it's about falls in the elderly. And they always say, well, this is great piece of research has been done. It was conducted in, I don't know, 1723. And it investigated 75 people over the age of 140. And in these case study case, everyone was pushed off a cliff and to see how well they survived. And those that broke their hips, they put in one group. And those that bounced back on top, they put in another group. Anyway, it's the same sort of bit of research. And it's always concentrated around falls in the elderly, which if you are in that category of potentially falling over and you are elderly, you would have gone, hmm, interesting, let me read. But for everyone else, they would be thinking to themselves, well, I, if I fall over, I just get up again. Or I'm not that elderly, as we will deny how old we are. So it didn't overlap into the general mainstream as much as it possibly could have. But it was still the research that everyone quoted for endlessly. So this week, I heard, and there's a link to this on the front 
page of my website and I'll also try and add it to this um, live stream is that there is a series of BBC radio programs called One, Just One Thing, I believe it's called. And it's presented by a doctor called Michael Mosley. And an episode caught my attention this week, and it's titled Standing on One Leg. Now, the idea of the series is that he takes, he investigates the work that's been done, the investigative work that's been done around one single thing you can do to improve your health. And this week, it was clearly going to be all about balance. And with a title like Standing on One Leg, it was bound to attract the attention of the Tai Chi community. However, as good as I thought it was, it failed on a number of points to address certain issues. But let's look at the good points, first of all. He says in the, in the interview and the other doctors and investigators that he interviews, he says that balance is what he defines or calls a marker of decline. Now, what does this mean? Because, you know, is it about elderly people falling over and breaking their hips? No, it's something actually more broader than that. And that's what makes it very interesting, I think, for us all to talk about. Because marker of decline is really saying that balance is a manifestation. It's a display of a lot of other conditions of health that are within us. And that gets exhibited in a way when we conduct ourselves in a balanced or a out of balance posture. What does that sound? It sounds a bit vague. So let me tell you a bit more details about what he said. Balance, your ability to stay balanced is a reflection of your joint health, your sensory systems. And by that could be neurological, could be, could be your, your uh, coordination, your eyes, your inner ear, your skin, even these are all sensory systems. And the functionality, the good functionality of those systems is reflected in your balance, your skills of balance, particularly with the brain and its ability to coordinate all of those different systems. Now, you may be saying, yeah, but, you know, I'm only 30 or 40 or something. I'm not going to fall over and break my hip. I'm fine. I'm not going to I'm not going to be affected by this yet. Show me show me the more interesting bits about Tai Chi. Well, I'm hold your horses there for a moment because we've also discovered that uh, past the age of 30 stroke 35, everyone's balance begins to decline and to decline progressively. Now, historically, that's always been the case for a whole series of different reasons, but even more so at the moment because of the generational changes that are going on around us. What generational changes Teapot Monk, I hear you all asking. Well, the first generational change is that we're becoming less mobile. We're becoming more sedentary. We sit around and instead of analog-like doing what we once did, we digitally do it. Examples such as this. So it's affecting every generation more and more at younger ages, and we need to find ways to address it in a positive way. It's not just as well about balance, because as the investigator says in the BBC program, that balance, your ability and your capacity for balance affects a number of things, such as your confidence, your posture, your mood, your even your appearance, and perhaps most significantly, your life expectancy. Yes, that's true. Life expectancy. You can expect to live more years depending on your capacity to remain upright. Now, in the article, in the podcast, they talk about standing on one leg. Well, I don't think that's enough to talk about that because it, it almost goes, now let's take it into the Tai Chi world. So in Tai Chi to, we, terms, we talk about how do we work our balance? Well, we talk about doing exercises on one leg, lift up one leg, keeps balanced on the other leg, change over to the other leg, adopt golden rooster as a posture in the form or practice the kickings, kicking forms, kicking moves that, uh, that work on one leg. Now, all of this is, for me, a interesting aspect of 
balance, but it's not the whole picture. We need to go beyond looking at static postures and holding ourselves in static positions, such as lifting a leg off the floor and taking the broader picture. And this is where the BBC podcast falls down, in my opinion. It doesn't refer to the essential other elements that we need to address in the body, such as what are we doing with our joints? Are they soft or are they locked? What are we doing with our eyes? Where are they? How about the inclination of the head and the spine? What's happening with the shoulders and the chest and the breathing? All of these are absolutely essential to look at too. Now, when we look at the form, what's happening there? Are we focusing on the postures or are we trying to broaden that concept and look at the whole movement as well? I'm sure a lot of you will turn around and say to me, well, it's the whole movement. Clearly it is. What are you talking about? So um, I just saw a comment. Anyway, uh, what are you talking about? It's clearly postures. Well, my argument is that as this week I was looking and researching some of the original footage for both Chen Manqing and some of his more well-known students, such as Dr. Chi and William Chen, I was watching the way that they were performing certain postures. And I'll give you an example of one. Step four deflect down was this in step and punch, or step and punch for short. Now, in this move, you can see that the First step forward, and this is where I was going to be demonstrating on the videos, and I was going to be going to a little corner down here and you would be seeing it all demonstrated. Hopefully we'll sort that out for another time, but you just have to imagine, use your imagination. It's probably good for you cognitively to do that. So Chen Manching, I looked at him first and he does this step forward and his foot barely leaves the ground. It's not really a sweeping movement. It doesn't even raise his leg. Hardly, it more like scrapes it across the ground. And then I had a look at Dr. Chi and he was even worse. It was more like his leg was broken. He just dragged it alongside with him. And William Chen, despite the fact he's still alive and knocking about and giving his lectures globally uh, in a very admirable fashion, he neither instigates any balance aspect to this move at all. And I wondered why it was that I had always traditionally and with other teachers have done this too. We've increased that movement. We've raised the knee. We've turned it out. We've very slowly shifted into what's called the cross step, gradually shifting the weight and balance into it, getting the joints to adjust and the sinews and ligaments to play full parts in the movement, not holding it, not static, not stopping at the end of the move, but keeping it flowing gently from one movement to the other, as we then go into the follow-up step, into the bow stance and the punch underneath it, which immediately shifts into withdraw and push, etc., etc. So why am I exaggerating this move? And in a sense, what am I doing here? That is it, is it contravening any of the principles of Tai Chi? Is it diverging from the original source of what those great masters were taught to pass down? Possibly. Who knows? And that's the gamble whenever you take a course with me. However, on a positive note, what I do think we're trying to do is we're looking at the research and the available material we have at any current moment and trying to apply it to what we are doing. No differently than what everyone else has done in the past, except that obviously in the case, and I've mentioned this before, in the history of the martial arts, transmissions has been passed down from teacher to teacher orally. This means that teachers are almost like awarded the position of teachership according to how well they emulate and copy what their teachers have done. So fundamentally, the same thing gets passed down generation after generation, generation. These aren't challenged generally. They're not particularly changed a great deal until, of course, the teacher dies. And then the students have a little bit of confidence to do some minor changes themselves. So where am I going with this? Well, to finish off, really, it's a focus on transitions. We're not looking at holding play guitar or golden rooster as an exercise in 
and for itself to develop balance. In the podcast, they talk about balance has to be challenged. Your ability to stay uh, upright has to be something that's constantly worked at. So it's no good if you can do golden rooster fine and you hold it and then move on to the next posture. What's important is how you transition from that move into the next and how you got from the previous posture into this one. It's there, it's specifically there in the transitions that I believe the benefits are acquired in Tai Chi and not in the postures themselves. And it's that that we're investigating in the Chen Manjin course. And it's that that I think holds the secrets, if there are any secrets at all, which I think is extremely dubious in the practice. But it's certainly there where the benefits are. It's in that slow, gradual shifting of body weight from part to a part and then and then moving on. So to recap, not static movements, it's all in the movements. And if you've done any of the exercises, like I said earlier, cat walking, for example, you'll know that it's the transitions and not the stages themselves. So where does this leave peripheral vision? Very, very quickly. Broadly, the position in Tai Chi is what happens to your eyes when you're doing Tai Chi? What should you be looking at? Well, fundamentally, your head is aligned with your waist. More or less, there are certain moves where it turns slightly differently, but fundamentally, where your waist and hips go, your head shifts. Now, do your eyes shift at the same time, or is it like this? trying to look forward, but your head's going one way. What's interesting is the eyes are generally following the hands as one hand becomes yang and the other becomes yin and this cycle continues. You generally often are focusing on those, but are you? My proposal is that we're not really focusing on those hands. We're not focusing on where our head's turning. What we're employing is what we, are, we now know is called peripheral vision, which is basically just an awareness of what's going on in front of you, behind you, above you, below you, and to both sides without having to look in all places at the same time. How do you develop peripheral vision where there's all these exercises about looking at your fingers as you move your hands apart? If you don't know them, have a look on my site. You'll see some of them there. If not, ask me and I'll talk about them another time. But peripheral vision means that you don't always have to turn your head to know what's going on around you. What's this to do with balance? Well, in the example of catwalking, for example, and throughout a Tai Chi form, you don't need to look at the floor in order to avoid obstacles. This goes back to the concept of balance. When you're walking in Tai Chi, in the classic meditative walking exercises, you're not studying your floor, you're not studying the ground, you're looking ahead of yourself, but you're aware if there's anything on the ground that you might need to step over. Especially if there's been dogs walking about in front of you. So what are we talking about here and why? Peripheral vision, Balance. What's it to do with the two? Let's go back to the uh, concept of static postures. If you're checking the ground to make sure that it's safe to move around in and you're not employing peripheral vision, what happens? Your head tilts forward, your body weight moves off its center and you lose balance. So in the exercise of improving your balance, you lose balance by checking on your balance. You must employ peripheral vision at all times. Don't study the ground. Once you understand the concepts of knees, joints, uh, uh, relaxed chest and shoulders, etc., etc., the three points on the bottom of the foot to maintain in contact with the ground, all of this uh, soft arms, legs, etc., etc., you don't need to look, you need to sense. And that sensory awareness, skin, brain coordination, inner ear, joint functions is all wrapped up in what I've just been talking about, which is the idea of developing balance. So the takeaway from it is it's not the postures. It's not the static moves in themselves. It's the movements that bring you to them and take you away from them where you really learn about 
the, uh, the benefits of balance. And secondly, it's those transitions that teach us all of how to coordinate that, those, those benefits. It's your eyes, it's the open joints, the three points on the foot, the breath, the relaxation, etc., etc. So to finish this off, if you want to check out those exercises, go to teapotmonk.com. On the first page, you'll see, I think, there'll be a link to several articles, one on walking, one on balance, uh, one on breath, and you'll find a whole series of articles there on what I'm talking about here. Second is you'll also find on that page a link to the original BBC podcast, Just One Thing, with... Uh, Look for the episode called Standing on One Leg. Let me know what you think in the comments, whether I've remembered it well. I probably have forgotten some of it or exaggerated some of it. So you can point that out to me, those of you who wish to. And finally, if you're still curious about how we can relate this to Tai Chi and how we can update the Tai Chi, then join us on the Chen Manjin course. Join us on the Academy with me, myself and I and the others there for weekly updates on how we can improve our Tai Chi with the research and the interesting uh, investigations that's happening all around us as we move out of hopefully this COVID period we're in, although pff, it's not looking like it's so positive at the moment, is it? Anyway, enough of that. Hope you've enjoyed this. Got any comments? Leave them in the comment box wherever you happen to see this. Thank you very much for sharing your time with me. I hope it's been of use. If it hasn't, tell me why and uh, I'll try and defend myself. No, I won't. No, I won't. I shall probably agree with you. And hopefully I'll see you for another webinar next month if you're on the Academy. And if not, have a great weekend and speak to you soon.